Hello, my name is Matt Leonard and I'm recording this video on behalf of the Foundry. In this video we're going to be looking at one of the new features of Nucate, the Camera Tracker. Now the Camera Tracker has three main workflows, Sequence, Stills and User Tracks. The Sequence, which is what we're going to be looking at in this video, really is designed to track a continuous frame sequence, really with minimal intervention from yourself. Stills, however, creates a camera track from reference frames taken on set and can be used for a whole host of things including building some rough geometry for projection work or even you can use wide angle shots to create geometry to tie into 3D survey points when you're using the user tracks to stitch things together. Now the user tracks allow you to manually place tracking markers to augment or even totally replace sequence or still tracks for specific known 3D survey points if they're available. And you can use those 3D survey points as we've said to tie your sequence to a known 3D well such as those created with stills. So we've really got three workflows very much tying together and working together to create a better track and to give you more information not only for tracking but also for model building, projection and a host of other things. Now as I said in this video we're going to be looking at sequence. So let's go ahead and load in our camera tracker. So I'm going to come to 3D and Camera Tracker. Now you may be familiar with this tracker from other versions of Nuke, but a number of things have changed in here, including the way the interface looks and also the way it thinks. So let's begin from the top. First off, what we need to do is look at the source. I can either have Sequence or Stills, and obviously in this class we're looking at Sequence. So I'm going to add that. If I have a mask to mask out anything that's moving in the shot, that needs to be done and that mask can be fed in here, either from the alpha coming directly in from the read node or above or coming in from the side using the mask input. For this I have nothing, so I'm going to leave this as none. Then we have the range, which is just how long the frames are lasting for and it's going to use the input which is getting the range from the read node coming in at the source. Then we can choose things like the kind of camera we've got and we're going to go with a free camera. Lens distortion if we know it and we don't, so I'm going to say unknown, unknown lenses. We can also choose the focal length which again we don't know but we know that it's constant so we're going to leave it on unknown but constant and the constant just means that there's no zoom taking place. If we know the film back size we can add it here and at the moment it's unknown so we're just going to leave it on custom and it's assuming to begin with that it's a full frame sensor 36 millimeters by 24 which would be a normal kind of 5D Canon camera. We then can come directly over to settings and there's a whole host of things here that you'll probably be familiar with if you've done any form of tracking before. Firstly, we tend to switch on the review features here and once the preview features is on, you can see the number of tracking points that's going to be put into the scene. We've got by the outset about 150, but I'm going to choose just to increase that just so we can see what happens. It's added quite a nice spread of points. Now we can also adjust things like the detection threshold and the feature separation. Detection threshold really just enables you to take tracking points out of flat areas. So if there is green screen or sky and you were getting tracking markers there, you can adjust this just to get rid of those in those areas. Also the feature separation, if I was to lower this or increase it, all the tracking markers would either push away from each other or clump together in groups. But this layout looks great. We've got a nice spread across the board. So I'm going to come in and turn off preview features and we're going to return to the camera track here. Next up we're going to go to the analyze section and just say track. So we're going to click that and let it run through. And as before with the other tracker from the version 7 you can see that this is just going to run through and once it gets to the end it will then reverse and come back again. Now that's completed we can see all of our 2D tracks and what you tend to do is you can tend to come in and just check them. Have a look across the board and see if there's anything unusual happening. Well here's something up here. It looks like it's picking up something but it just seems to be not quite doing what all the other tracks are doing. So I'm going to assume that this one's probably not quite right. I'm going to select it with my left mouse button and then right click tracks and delete selection and I can carry on coming across and seeing if there's anything else that looks strange to me. Well, everything else in this area looks okay. 
every now and again you get a few stray ones like this one seems to be kind of jumping around so again maybe I would choose just to come in and delete that you don't want to spend too long doing this just long enough to get anything that looks strange but later on in the process when we begin to go through and clean this up where you can nail all those ones that are not doing what we expect so having got this far we could potentially come back to settings again and decide whether to make any changes here but this all looks fine for what we need for today so I'm going to come back to the camera tracker and I'm going to click on solve this is now going to run through much quicker than the camera track did originally and work out how to solve this where the camera would be based on these tracking points so we'll just let that finish off and we now have a solve now below solve we have this RMS error value 0.86 and that's a pretty good value though if we can get it down it's going to help us no end. Anything above 1 is definitely getting a bit dodgy and if you're looking at values 2, 3 or 4 then there's definitely something that's going to need some serious work to get that value down. But below 1 and definitely in this region is looking good straight off the bat but let's look at how we can improve that. What we're going to do is we're going to come across to Auto Tracks here and you'll be very familiar with this layout. It looks similar to the old Refine tab that we had in Nuke 7. First off, we're going to come in and we're going to have a look at the minimum length of tracks. So I'm going to choose Track Length Minimum and then I'm going to hold Command or Control down and click Minimum Length. And you can see the minimum length relates to this bar which relates to this slider. And as I now adjust this, you can see that I can basically say that the threshold of the minimum frames can be adjusted. So I could bring it up to say clip off all of the minimum frames. If I just drag this down a bit, you can see anything under 10 frames is now getting completely chopped off. And in here you can see that a bunch of our uh, little markers have gone red to tell us now that they're going to be rejected. Now let's come down to the maximum track error. So that would be the RMS error here and then I would do command or control click and click the maximum track error. Again in here I could just click again with my mouse and then press F to frame up in the viewer and then I'm what I'm looking for are peaks where you've got something like this that's really sticking up that potentially is just an error that's taking place in this region. So what I tend to do is drop this down so it just begins to chop off some of these peaks. Now you want to be careful if you go too far down you're going to chop off an awful lot of your point clouds and then you're not going to have anything left to kind of work with with your point clouds later on in 3D space. So you don't want to get too excited with this just kind of chop off at a level similar to this. The final thing we can come down to is the maximum error. So we can come to error max and then control or command click max error. Again I'm going to click in here with my left mouse button, F to frame up and then bring this down again just to begin to chop into this top section and I don't want to go too far just somewhere like this. Now having got this far I would now delete the unsolved and rejected tracks. So I'm going to click unsolved and say yes and anything that might have been orange which wasn't in our shot visible then they would be the ones that it didn't know what to do with and they will be deleted. And then the ones that we've rejected by dropping these values in the maximum length, track error and max error these will also be deleted. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And now we're left with potentially just the nice ones. So having done that we're going to return to our camera tracker tab and I'm going to click solve again and this will now resolve the camera based on what we have here. So we'll let this run through. Now having clicked on that we're now getting an RMS error of 0.7 which isn't too bad at all. From there we would then do the final export and this is obviously what we would do with regards to making the cameras and the point clouds that we'll be using in our scene. So we've got uh, quite a number of options now camera, camera rig, scene, scene plus, point cloud, distortion, undistortion and card. You can see as you hover over what everything does, camera simply creates the camera on its own, the camera rig creates a multi-view camera or stereo camera set, scene creates the scene with a camera and a point cloud which is really very traditional to what we've had before in Nuke. Scene Plus creates a scene with a camera, point cloud, scanline render and undistortion uh, lens distortion node. Point cloud is just the point cloud for the camera solve. 
distortion and undistortion gives you the lens distortion nodes and then the card creates a group of cards so we're just going to go with scene and we're going to say create and now you can see we've got a nice little setup where we've got our point cloud here we've got our camera if I do Alt E and switch on my expression arrows, you can see it goes back to the camera tracker. We also have an expression driving our lens distortion. Again, Alt E to turn those expression arrows off. Scene node, scan line renderer. If I view the scene and I just hit play, you can see that we're getting a very nice lineup now with all of our point cloud uh, just composited over the background with a simple over due to the fact that it's coming in through the side of the scan line as the BG input. And you can see everything is sticking really nicely. And if I just rewind again back to the beginning, you can just see getting a really nice track there. Okay, now from here, we wanted to add our rubbish bin into the scene. So to save having to set everything up, I'm just gonna load one that I have prepared earlier. Okay, so that's now loaded in. And we'll zoom in and just go full screen just so I can talk you through what's going on here. So this section is making the rubbish bin and we're basically using an environment light to add reflections onto the bin and then a spotlight as our key light. And then this section here in this kind of pinky red color, this is basically setting up the reflections so that we're actually getting true reflections of the environment into the dustbin. So let me just show you what the final scene looks like. So if we hit play, there's our animation and you can see the camera track that we've done looks really nice. And we're getting nice um, look to our dustbin uh, for a quick job, it's looking pretty integrated. So what have we done in detail? So first off, we made a model builder node. And if I just view that, this is the uh, geometry that we made. And this is simply there to enable us to project onto something so that we can actually capture the environment. So if I look through the camera and I just switch this on, and so if we come across, you can see here is the geometry that we've exported from the model builder. Again, if we just come back to our default, there it is. And what we're doing is we're taking our original image, which is here. We're, we're shuffling in alpha into the background and then we're projecting onto that and applying the material directly on. So you can see there is our environment. Now it's not obviously perfect, but all we need it for is reflections that we're going to blur anyway, because they're going to go on to kind of a rough stainless steel finish for the bin. So that's going to be perfect. Now once we've made this, we're now able obviously to kind of take pictures from any direction, up, down, left, right, forward, and obviously back is a little bit more tricky because there's a big open hole here, but we'll fix that with some paint. So I've taken a scanline renderer, and I've taken a camera and I've put my camera right in the middle. You can see if we zip around here, here's the camera and I've animated it over six frames just to go in every direction. So it goes up, down, left, right, forward, back. And then I've done a frame hold from the scanline renderer, which is outputting as a cubic file or a square file. And that cubic information, the top, front, back, left, right and bottom are all then coming into a spherical transform node where we've got cubic in lat long out remember lat long has to be a two by one ratio so if we view that you can see that's what we're getting and there's the hole that we pointed out earlier so from there i've just done a little bit of paint and roto and just painted that in and then i've added a blur because i think it's going to hide some of this and also it's going to work well for what i need that then is applied directly to my environment map here. So if I look, zoom out, there's my kind of environment light there, which is kind of doing environment mapping into the scene. Now I've taken uh, a dustbin Alembic file, which looks like so, transformed it into place. So it's now inside the room. It's right down here, there it is. I have given it a texture which is a steel texture, looks like that. And then we are 
taking this floor section and the floor section is just a fong, standard fong, nothing clever going on there, fill mat and then a card and the card is basically capturing the shadows that are coming off my spotlight here. So if I view that you can see we're getting a nice bit of lighting on that and the lighting that we're getting is both from the spotlight which is here and also the environment light around it. Now when we render that out we end up with something like this and what I've done is I've taken the shadows if we look at the spotlight and I've output the shadows into a spotlight.shadow channel set and channel. So if we now come to spotlight, come to the red channel and we make sure we're viewing it again. What you're going to see down here now is that shadow appearing. Okay, so there's our shadow. What I've then done, if we just come back to our RGB, I've then done a basic grade, which is matching everything into the background. So you've got black point and white point. That's the blackest part of the trash can and the brightest part of the trash can. Lift and gain, which actually if you hover over it tells you it's black and white, which enables you to know that the lift is actually what the black is being matched to. So black point is being matched to lift white point is being matched to gain so the lift and gain these are the colors of the bright of the darkest rather and the lightest parts of the thing that you're matching into so this is the darkest and the lightest of the trash can this is the darkest and lightest point of the background i'm matching to i've then just done a slight molt and gamma and made sure that i'm obviously pre-multiplying to my alpha that obviously needs to be on and my mask can be off. From there, I'm just doing a very slight desaturation and then I'm applying my lens distortion to that. Now it's very important that the lens distortion is only being applied to our trash can. So let me just remind you, I'm sure you're very aware of this. Our lens distortion that's been output here is only so that we can use the undistorted footage for the tracking and also for the model builder and things like that. What we don't want to do is we do not want to understore our footage, add everything in and then redistort it again because as you probably know, the lens distortion node here has a filter. So if you're undistorting your background and then redistorting it later, you're applying two filter hits. If you only add distortion to the elements being composited into the background, then those new elements are only receiving one filter hit. So you're going to end up with a nicer non-soft image. Okay. So all of that is then being piped into our merge node here. If we just move back and make sure we're back on RGB, we can see it. And then the shadow, because we have that mask, I'm literally just now doing a grade, grading specifically just the shadow section here. So you can see now we've got a nice shadow and I can adjust how bright or dark it is based on my gain slider here. Okay, so what I had it set to was what I liked. So that is all I've done. Again, if we just watch the final output and I hit play, you can see we're getting really nice integration. The camera track has done a fantastic job of taking the sequence of images and working out where the camera was. And then we've just added this new element into the scene just to show off the uh, quality of the track. So this has been Matt Leonard for The Foundry. Thank you for watching and look out for more videos coming soon.